It's a pleasure to have uh, a discussion here. Uh, I should explain to those who are not here. We've been through a series of three sessions on Islam with uh, substitutes because of the illness of the, of the or person arranged. And we never were quite sure who we would get to our particular Sunday. So when I say it's a pleasure to have our discussion here with us today, I'm being very sincere here. here. Dr. Roger L. Shen is the Reinhold Niebuhr uh, Professor of Social Ethics and Emeritus at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, he taught for many years at uh, Columbia as well and has been adjunct, adjunct professors, professor at uh, another at least half a dozen institutions across the country. Uh, a person who has been called upon within the field of ethics by many, many uh, others. Uh, he has uh, uh, worked around the world in Eastern and Western Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, in China, and in Japan. Uh, in relation to the uh, World Council of Churches program on uh, uh, ethics in the US, he chaired the National Council of Churches uh, Task Force on Human Life and uh, the New Genetics. He has been president of the American Theological Society and the Society for Christian Ethics. <coughs> and he uh, has produced books, books, and books, and books, 15 of them, I think, maybe 16 now. And I've had the pleasure this week of reading his latest, which is here, and I am going to recommend it to you because it is a fascinating uh, account of the subject that he will be talking about. I won't say any more about it right now, but, but perhaps he will. Uh, Dr. Shin, it's a very great pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, it's uh, good to be back at the uh, Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, where uh, I've uh, never been a member but uh, I've uh, known this church uh, longer than uh, some of you, I'll bet. Uh, uh, coming in this morning, I saw the uh, portrait of my two revered uh, teachers, Henry Sloan Coffin and uh, George Buttrick. When I first came to uh, New York, the Union Seminary, the president was uh, Henry Sloan Coffin, who also taught. And uh, one of the comments that students always used when they did uh, takeoffs on him uh, was in my 21 years at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. <laughs> then uh, uh, George Buttrick uh, was his uh, successor, uh, also my teacher. And then when he went on to uh, Harvard, uh, invited me uh, up there for some uh, occasions. And uh, then I had a long friendship with uh, David Reed. So uh, it's uh, good to be back here again. Now, uh, our uh, subject is uh, genetic decisions and Christian faith. And uh, Phil Talbot has given me uh, permission to vary a little bit from the uh, printed sequence of topics. Today's subject will be the meeting of faith and science. And in a way, we'll be talking about that uh, all three periods. And we'll just uh, sort of crack open the uh, door today and then uh, push it farther the next two times. Uh, next week, ethical and political decisions. Decisions that some of you will be making in your families that institutions will make, the government will make. And then the third week, uh, understanding ourselves. What does this new knowledge tell us about ourselves? And that's uh, really the uh, place I'm going to head in today. So I'll put up there, uh, you and I. You and I, in our bodies, contain up to 100 trillion cells. Uh, that's a pretty big uh, person, and the estimate may be slightly uh, high. Uh, uh, no, nobody really counted them, you see. And once, you were a single cell. That is, inside your mother's body, many sperm competed in a race to get to that cell, and one of them won and merged with it. Uh, this could happen in a, a test tube, but looking over you, I don't think any of you are young enough that uh, that could have happened to you. It was uh, inside a uh, woman's uh, body. Now, the size of that fertilized egg 
has been described by uh, Francis Crick as a millionth of the size of a pinhead. Now, that's pretty small. Uh, uh, pinhead, a millionth of it. And at that point, your genetic constitution was complete. It never changed from then on unless there was a mutation, which is uh, rare. Uh, that doesn't mean that your future characteristics were all determined, only insofar as they're genetic. Uh, it is determined whether you be male or female, a, a lot of other things. But uh, a whole lot can happen after that. The genetic determination was complete then. That cell began dividing, one into two, two into four, four into eight. And uh, this is happening pretty fast. By the time it's eight, from eight to 16, the cells begin to differentiate. Because some are going to end up uh, eye cells, uh, stomach cells, uh, all kinds of things you see. Up to eight, uh, they're all uh, the same. Now most of those cells are what we call somatic cells, which just means a bodily cells. And uh, of these, almost all have a nucleus. Your red corpuscles don't, but the rest have a uh, nucleus. And within that nucleus, are 46 chromosomes, 2 times 23. Some of them coming from your mother, some of them coming from your uh, father. And uh, once in a while they split and you get a half of one from uh, mom and a half of one from uh, dad. But uh, there they are. Now uh, the germ cells are something different. That is, they are in the male, the sperm, and the uh, female, uh, the eggs. and uh, they have only 23 chromosomes. So you see when a sperm with 23 chromosomes merges with an egg with 23, you get your uh, 46. Now I've uh, mentioned that these are very small. Her Herman Muller, a uh, world famous geneticist, in 1933 estimated that the quantity of germ cells for the whole human race was scarcely a teaspoon. Now allowing for the top population uh, explosion uh, was between uh, two and three teaspoons now. Uh, obviously distributed very uh, widely. But uh, this gives you a, a sense of uh, what an amazingly uh, complex uh, thing uh, a human person uh, is, even on simply the uh, physical uh, genetic uh, size. Uh, my uh, friend uh, Erwin Shargoff, the late uh, geneticist at uh, Columbia University and uh, one who contributed a great deal to the uh, history we'll be looking at, referred to the lyrical shudder that moves the scientist to tears before the mysteries of nature that we can only touch tangentially. Now not all geneticists look at it that way. Uh, that just is a religious judgment. Uh, science doesn't require you to uh, go into a lyrical uh, shudder uh, to uh, gasp in awe at the uh, mystery of it all. Uh, some do and some don't. Now it's very important, and uh, some of this you learned in, uh, if you ever took a course in biology, high school or uh, college, uh, very important to distinguish between the germ cells and the somatic because they don't affect each other very much. For instance, uh, suppose you're a man descended from 20 generations of blacksmiths, all of whom have been building up those uh, big uh, muscles in their arms. You will have no stronger muscles than if those 20 had been uh, couch potatoes. Nothing of what they have piled up that way affects you because your arms are the result of your germ cells and what you did with them uh, from uh, then on. Now, the health of your parents, mother and father, may have a lot to do with your health. Uh, this is why, for instance, recently uh, doctors have been advising pregnant women to 
abstain from tobacco and uh, alcohol. That can affect the developing fetus in the body. So uh, the, the health of the parents affects the children, but not uh, directly their uh, heredity. Now I want to look at a little bit of the uh, history of uh, what's happened here. That is an utterly uh, fascinating story. Through most of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history, ideas about genetics are a combination of a few observations. So and so takes after uh, Aunt uh, Susie, and uh, so and so's sister doesn't. People noticed that, you see, wondered about it. Uh, observations and a lot of superstition and nonsense. And the first great leap came from the Austrian monk Gregor Mendel in 1865. And as a lot of you know, he grew peas in the monastery garden and kept track of their characteristics. Now pick out just one characteristic from the many that uh, he worked on, uh, the color. He had green peas, he had yellow peas. He crossed them, and to his surprise, they were all yellow. Green just totally lost. Then he crossed this second generation, or the first generation hybrids, we call them, the F1s, up. Uh, all of them yellow, and the result, about a quarter of them were green. See, the green had leaped a generation. Now, Mendel was seeing what people had seen for thousands of years, but it caught his mind. And he was something of a statistician, a fairly young science then, and he got to work on this and laid down some of the laws of genetics that are just as important now as when he discovered them. We've learned an awful lot since, but nothing has overruled what he did. And out of this, he, he didn't coin our language. But to put it in our language, what he was saying is that uh, there's a gene for yellow and a gene for green, and yellow's dominant. Whenever yellow and green come together, yellow will win, but green will stay there as a recessive. Then when you breed the next generation, if you get two recessive genes meeting, some of them will uh, turn out to be uh, greens. And that, I say, is just as true now as then. And it is still true that there are certain diseases of which a parent will show no symptom at all. Parents appear to be perfectly healthy in that regard, but their children are at a one out of four risk. Faisox would be the uh, most uh, famous example of that. If both parents test positive for it, and we do have tests now, neither parent shows any symptoms, but both test positive, the children are at risk of one in four. Since that's been learned, the prevalence of Tay Sachs in this country dropped 80% in one decade. That's what some of this new knowledge uh, can do. Now, if it's a dominant gene, your parents will show symptoms. But take a famous one, uh, Huntington's uh, disease, uh, does not appear until ages 35 to 45. It's a terrible disease at that stage, but uh, a, a parent might have given birth to children without ever knowing it. And because that's a dominant one, the child's at a one in two risk instead of one in four. And uh, Nancy Wexler of uh, Columbia is the uh, famous woman who did so much of the uh, research that uh, led to the possibility of tests and the location of that uh, gene in the uh, human body. She got interested in it because her mother died of it. And she know, knew the chances were one out of two of uh, her uh, having it. Well, all that I say, uh, it, it, that's a little more than Mendel knew. He didn't go into these particular diseases, you see, but it's uh, all based on his ideas. Now, Mendel's work was quickly forgotten. 
uh, published an obscure uh, journal and uh, nobody uh, much uh, knew anything uh, about it. Uh, Mendel had read Darwin. And it's interesting, this uh, Austrian monk wasn't the least bit bothered by uh, what uh, Darwin uh, turned up. Darwin never read Mendel, and he'd been saved some of the mistakes if he had. Uh, Mendel uh, pretty soon quit his uh, work because he became head of the monastery. And to him, that was more important. And who is to say what's more important, making a new scientific discovery or uh, taking care of uh, your little uh, corner of the uh, earth and uh, training other monks? Uh, but in the 20th, or very end of the 19th century, Mendel was rediscovered. And then in the 20th century came a burst of activity. And the first big thing that I'll bother, I'll just, just be very selective. First big thing was the discovery in 1944 of deoxyribonucleic acid. I have to look at it to pronounce it. And then I stumble sometimes. Nobody wants to say that very many times. So you take the D and the N and the A. That's the DNA that uh, you hear so much about today. A chromosome, one of those, is a macromolecule. Now, macro simply means big. And a big molecule, it is a very big one as molecules go. Uh, still pretty small, uh, you know, in that millionth of a uh, pinhead. It's a strand of DNA. If you unpack a human cell, just one cell, a somatic cell, with its 46 chromosomes, you'll find they average a little more than six feet long, about six meters. And uh, that's uh, every, uh, in every chromosome. Now, if you multiply six uh, meters by 46, your number of uh, chromosomes, that's about 276 feet of DNA in every cell of your body. And if you've got 100 trillion uh, cells, uh, you multiply it out, divide by the distance of the sun, it would reach the sun and back 610 times with little to spare. It's in your body. Now, I'm not much at arithmetic, uh, and you don't trust my figures, but uh, the uh, chairman of statistics at uh, Columbia University, who happens to be my son-in-law, went over these, and uh, so I'm uh, pretty sure they're uh, right. How can it be that your body has in it stuff that had reached to the sun and back 610 times with a few miles to spare, a few million to spare, probably? Well, these chromosomes are very, very skinny. Their length is 100 million times their width. And they're coiled in there very tightly. They don't mind crowds. Uh, if they were uh, claustrophobic, uh, you would really be a mess. <laughs> now, in 19, the 1940s, the composition of DNA was discovered. It's made up of what are called nucleotides. The nucleotides are little packets. Uh, you don't have to remember this. They include a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And those nitrogenous bases are of four kinds. And because the names are, again, hard to pronounce, we just use the initials A, G, C, and T. In uh, your body, there are maybe uh, three billion nucleotides. Again, nobody's uh, really uh, counted them. But, uh, that's the uh, best uh, estimate. And AGCT become the alphabet of heredity. They spell out all the hereditary possibilities you have. Now, again, there are other possibilities not hereditary, but they spell it all out. Now, at first glance, you might say, uh, how could all the varieties of human beings over uh, hundreds of thousands of years be spelled out with an alphabet of just four. Well, in digital communication, uh, you spell out anything with an alphabet of two, a zero and a one. Not only words, uh, you can transmit music, uh, 
uh, art, uh, so on. So a four is plenty, uh, uh, more than enough. Uh. Now this uh, DNA again is amazing stuff. Scientists have actually used it to solve computer problems, and some think future compu computers, DNA computers, will have abilities far beyond the best current silicon possibilities. Again, this is all in you. Now, don't get too chesty about this. Uh, there's some humbling parts of it. Uh, we share this genetic alphabet with other forms of life. Let me read you the statement of one geneticist. Our chromosomes differ from those of the chimpanzees in approximately 1% of the genes. Precious little DNA differs between the zookeepers and the zoo inhabitants. <laughs> it's possible to combine genes from bacteria, yeasts, plants, and animals. Uh, scientists do a lot of their research on the mouse, because most human genes can be found in the mouse. And you'd rather experiment on the mouse than on uh, your child. They're now transplanting human genes into a mouse in order to study Alzheimer's disease. Now, there's a long ways to go on that one, because Alzheimer's is really a family of diseases, but uh, that's it. Uh, all right, this is a blow to human arrogance if you uh, build your self-esteem on uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Lewis Thomas, uh, famous biologist of this city, says that ants are so much like human beings as to be an embarrassment. And still, there's an immense difference. And one example is that humans study mouse genes, mice don't study human genes. <laughs> All right, the next great discovery came in 1953 in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University, where two brash young scientists, Francis Crick and James Watson, met each other and I went to work on a project wasn't really assigned to them. It was sort of a uh, spare time thing, or they were stealing time from what they were supposed to be uh, doing. Now, if your image of science is that of uh, austere men and women in white uh, jackets, uh, uh, utterly devoted only to the pursuit of truth, uh, this story uh, may upset you. Uh, uh, Crick and Watson were uh, playboys, competitors, uh, spent so much time uh, chasing tennis balls and chasing skirts that uh, <laughs> folks wondered if they were really doing their uh, science, but they were brilliant and in a sense disciplined. They did an immense amount of work, relied also on the work of many others, and came up with a fresh idea called the double helix, which uh, you've seen uh, many a, a picture of. Uh, here's a, a diagrammatic picture of it. See the helix is like a spiral staircase, and you get the two of them uh, intertwined. Uh, now here is a, a computer-generated image of it. This is not to say they're really that color. That's uh, what the computer uh, uses to uh, distinguish them. Now they got the idea, uh, was it true? Well, they built a physical model taller than themselves, or got technicians to build it, to show that it was possible, as the measurements all uh, fit. And then some other work was uh, done, and uh, just about everybody was uh, convinced uh, this is right. Now I've used the term gene, and I haven't defined it. A gene is a segment of a chromosome. There may be uh, 100,000 in a human cell. Uh, I've read estimates 50,000 to 240,000. But they seem to be gravitating toward uh, 100,000. Why don't we know? We know so much, why don't we know that? Well, there's no signpost that says gene number one ends here and number two uh, starts here. Uh, you identify a gene as the code or the collection of nucleotides that produces a particular protein for building the body. 
And so you don't know necessarily just what the margins uh, are. Uh, there can even be genes within genes. So uh, maybe we'll never get a uh, count. Uh, there's also uh, what's called junk DNA. There's uh, 95 to 97 percent of that the DNA has no known function. So they call it junk DNA. Now, uh, a lot of times we find out that what has no known function uh, later turns out to have an important function. So uh, junk may be a premature uh, judgment. But that 3 to 5 percent is, for the moment at least, the important thing. All right, uh, one more uh, big step, recombinant DNA, commonly called uh, gene splicing or genetic engineering. You can slice up this DNA and rearrange it. Now, stop and think. Again, a millionth the size of a pinhead. It's no wonder that uh, Muller, a Nobel laureate in biology, said in 1968, you'll never be able to do this. How could you imagine a, a scalpel uh, small enough and sharp enough to go in there and uh, cut this. Uh, Jacques Monod, another uh, Nobel laureate in uh, biology and medicine in 1970, again said it could never be done. All right, never say never. It happened. And it was not a miniature scalpel. It's what uh, we call for fun uh, chemical scissors. Some enzymes will cut DNA. And sometimes the right enzyme will go to the right place and cut the DNA where you want it. Now by right, I mean right for your purposes. And then you can send another fragment of DNA into the gap. And the delivery agent called a vector is a retrovirus, that is a virus genetically uh, modified, uh, so it won't hurt you. Uh, now you see there are an awful lot of chances for errors here. And we'll go into that more next uh, week. Uh, suppose you slice the DNA in the wrong place. Suppose the retrovirus goes to the wrong place. Suppose the new DNA doesn't get accepted and integrated by the uh, host. Uh, note this, some of the retroviruses they use are very similar to the HVI virus. Uh, treated so it won't hurt you. But given the chances of mutation, uh, it, it might. Uh, you see, why well, I don't want anybody messing around with my DNA without an awful lot of testing, and then as a last resort. But if I were in the early stages of Alzheimer's, and if, contrary to the present fact, they discovered a treatment that might cure that, at some risk to me, it might kill me, uh, I might then say, yes, go ahead. I mean, uh, what have I got to lose? A uh, uh, chance of uh, gaining something. All right, I'm almost ready for your questions. But first, some more initials. The Human Genome Project, sometimes called the Human Genome Initiative, was authorized by Congress and begun in 1991. Jim Watson, the partner of Francis Crick, whom I mentioned earlier, was the first director of it. Now a greatly matured uh, man with a lot of uh, administrative ability as well as scientific skills. Congress appropriated $113 million toward an estimated cost of $3 billion over 15 years. And its aim is to make a map of the human genes. And beyond that, the next step, the sequencing, again, you don't have to remember all these details, but it gives you a notion of uh, what it's uh, about. The sequencing is going inside the gene to that AGCT code. And if you would uh, spell out that uh, code, uh, I'd say it'd be uh, maybe three billion, and if you'd put it in bound volumes and print it, uh, it would be the equivalent of about 13 sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Not 13 volumes, 13 sets. 
Now, nobody's going to spend many evenings reading combinations of AGCT, you see, through uh, all these uh, volumes. Uh, they probably never print it. Uh, put it in a computer and they can find out uh, what they need to know at any particular uh, time. The project is still going on. It's been successful beyond expectations. I mean, some folks say you never uh, get a project like this uh, that, uh, where there aren't cost overruns. Uh, this will come out probably a little under uh, budget and uh, maybe a little faster than was uh, expected. It's, uh, it's going on in many laboratories with marvelous coordination. As a Columbia takes on a project, Harvard takes on one, uh, Caltech takes on one, they share their uh, knowledge and uh, don't uh, all of them uh, do the same thing. Hugo is the international coordinating agency, Hugh Genome. And it's just, it doesn't do research, and it's for exchange of information. And again, this is going very well. Uh, there's not a whole lot of competition. Uh, the, the French do a project, the British and the Germans and we, and uh, they uh, share their uh, knowledge. And then Elsie. Jim Watson, I think maybe it was Al Gore, then in Congress, who originated this, said the ethical issues connected with this thing are so important, so difficult, that a little bit of that budget should be allocated to the study of the ethics. And uh, Jim Watson decided to be 3%. And that is funding various projects of this uh, kind, of which uh, I participated in some. Uh, one was co-sponsored by the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Law Association, because there are a lot of legal problems involved, and uh, they worked together on it, and uh, got in a few characters like uh, me to uh, participate. Another one, a three-year one, uh, centered in uh, Berkeley, uh, California, worked on this, and uh, my book, which Phil mentioned, uh, came out of uh, that. Now, uh, I don't want to deceive you. I am not a geneticist. Don't uh, have any mistakes that way. Anything I've told you about genetics is not the least bit original. If it were, you should distrust it. Uh, I'm just not that uh, good. I don't think I've misled you because I've had some pretty good geneticists uh, uh, go over this uh, with me and uh, root out uh, a few uh, mistakes. But why should a guy like me, actually I've been into this for 30 years, but uh, Elsie gave me a kind of new uh, a boost on the way. Uh, why would I get into, the, into that? Why not leave it to the geneticists? Would you want our policies on nuclear weapons to be determined solely by nuclear engineers? Well, you'd want them in on it. You'd want geneticists in on this. You don't want any project without their uh, participation. But uh, the decisions are going to be made by worried parents on the recommendation of doctors. Hospitals will decide that we'll go this way or we uh, won't. Congress will say we'll give the money for this or that. The Food and Drug Administration will say we will uh, license this or we won't. So everybody's in on the uh, act. And it's very important that some people who are not geneticists do it. Now, a last word for today. Our uh, initial uh, topic was the meeting of faith and science. I haven't said much about that uh, yet. And uh, again, uh, some of it will have to go till uh, next time. Faith and science do meet here. It's obvious in Mendel. And it's still going on. What are you going to make of all this? Well, one thing to be clear about is the Bible is not a book of science. The creation story, the uh, story of uh, everything about uh, human life is not a scientific report. And science, as such, does not make a judgment on the values of what it's doing. I mean, a particular scientist may pick a project because 
he or she believes it's valuable, but that's a, a, a belief. So faith and science have got to meet at that point. There's a point of the application, particularly. And my field has been ethics, and so I'm more interested in that than I am in uh, some of the metaphysical aspects. But uh, it's very interesting what people make of this. Francis Crick, Watson's partner, entered this with one aim to confirm his atheism, to show that you could get an adequate physical chemical explanation of everything human without any resort to religion. Uh, Salvador Dali, no scientist, but a writer, said, uh, the work of Watson and Crick is for me the real proof of the existence of God. Now, I disagree with both of them. I don't think this proves the existence of God. Uh, to a person who responds with reverence, uh, it may be a uh, testimony to the uh, mystery of the uh, wonders of uh, God. I uh, don't think it disproves the existence of God. Uh, uh, faith must always take account of the scientific description of the world in which we live, but uh, it's uh, something uh, different. Uh, my old teacher, Reinhold Niebuhr, near the end of his career wrote, the mystery of human selfhood is only a degree beneath the mystery of God. Look at all that. Uh, that is an amazing mystery. And uh, it uh, leaves me with the uh, words of the uh, 139th Psalm. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. We are fearful and wondrous creatures. Uh, we're fragile, vulnerable in all kinds of ways. But uh, Job knew that long ago, as uh, did uh, almost all the writers of the Bible. Now it's time for whatever uh, questions uh, you might have, or whatever arguments. Yes? Sorry, what's the letter E-L-F-I stand for? What's the? E-L-F-I. Oh. Ethical, legal, social issues. And uh, though a lot of people are working on this, uh, the governmentally sponsored part is uh, about 3% of the total budget. And on a uh, very rough calculation, if you're in one of the upper income brackets, uh, oh, one or two cents of uh, your uh, income tax uh, has come to me to fund some uh, work on this. Uh, uh, the government has no say over results. That money is uh, distributed by the uh, Department of uh, Health, Education, Welfare, and the Department of Energy. And they uh, receive uh, proposals and uh, fund them and uh, coordinate the work. Another question? What yes? more advanced human being come out of all of this than what we now know? Uh, the ramifications of uh, brilliance of mind. Yeah. Like, how about that? I will say a little more about that uh, next time, but that is part of the, uh, the, the mystery of the thing. That that uh, little alphabet should, uh, it's often called information. It gives the information for your heredity should lead to the combination of proteins that uh, makes uh, possible uh, Shakespeare's plays and uh, Bach's music and uh, Rembrandt's uh, paintings and uh, all the capacities of the human body, mind, and soul is the, uh, the um, mystery of the things. And uh, 
next time I will warn you against attributing too much to the chemistry of it all. Uh, a lot of things happen after you're born. Uh, certain things are determined, you see, uh, got that instant of conception, but a lot happens after that. Would uh, eugenism as the Hitler conceived it was some sort of crude idea that would bring a, a better race and all this, the, the choosing of certain individuals to produce it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the 19th century, well, was a cousin of Darwin, originated what he called the science of eugenics. How can we produce a better human race? Eugenics got an awfully bad name under the Nazis. You see, uh, their idea of a better human race was a lot of stormtroopers. And uh, though their science was very bad, they deliberately aimed to produce more of those. Uh, every attempt at eugenics has been guided by some idea of what an ideal person is. And you look at it a few years later and you say, uh, wow, how could they have ever thought that? It's, it's a very dangerous thing. And today, even people who believe in eugenics don't use the word. It's got such a bad reputation. And when I've worked on this project in Germany, I found the German people are much more scared of this than the Americans. The Americans tend to be optimists. They know all the dangers are there, but they tend to be optimists. The Germans with that legacy of uh, Hitler uh, tend to say, if some of these things can be done, things we'll talk about next time, uh, they can be misused uh, terribly. I'm curious, we've been talking more how your work with Elsie is progressing, because I'm kind of scared uh, that our scientific knowledge is going faster than the wisdom uh, to use it or handle it. Yeah. See, I, I've got very mixed feelings about Elsie myself. If you don't do something like that, then uh, the, the scientific juggernaut kind of moves ahead, and uh, a generation later you look back and say, why did we ever let that happen? See, with uh, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, at the time there was no doubt among the, secret, uh, among the few in the secret group that knew about it. Uh, this is what they should be doing. Uh, no, nobody was, well, if they were asking the questions, they were suppressing them. And so uh, Gore, Watson, and some others were saying, let's not let this go ahead without some ethical judgments. But uh, do we have any confidence that those ethical judgments will be right? No. Now, you see, I, I mentioned eugenics. The, uh, I mentioned the Germans as the awful example. In the 19th century, most of the eugenicists were what we call liberal. Uh, I mean, not in the sense that uh, Republicans uh, today uh, make, talk about the L word. Uh, uh, they believed in uh, education, uh, humane uh, values. Uh, some of the women suffragists, who were noble on that front, were very bad on the racial front. Uh, there, the idea most of them had of an ideal person was uh, white, uh, well-educated, uh, intelligent, healthy, uh, uh, some of which we might like. But you see, uh, wh what's a genetic defect? Well, I don't have the slightest doubt that Tay Sachs no parent wants a child to have Tay Sachs. But uh, a generation ago, a lot of people thought a dark skin color was a genetic defect. And if you read the newspaper, the uh, magazines designed for black readers at that time, you find many ads for skin lighteners and hair straighteners and uh, so on. 
And if there'd been a, a gene for skin lightening, they'd probably have used it. Well, what, what's wrong with the dark skin? Uh, see, all you have to do is decide uh, black too is beautiful. And you don't have to go into uh, messing around with, uh, with, uh, with genes. And so, you know, it just might be that the best work of Elsie would uh, come up with some bad ideas. Because ideas that 100 years from now would be recognized as bad. That's part of life. Uh, to, to put a funny note in this, uh, in the 18th century, we had a French writer called Diderot who had a lot of imagination and imagined cloning already. And he had imagined a race where you would have some people who would be pro programmed to like nothing better than doing dishes and other <laughs> uh, liking to sweep the streets. And you would have a humanity that would be specialized in uh -huh. certain tasks. You refer to Diderot? Yeah, that's he. I did not know that. I'm very glad you told me. See, uh, Plato had that idea long before. You want four classes of people. And up here were the elite. Uh, uh, good soldiers, smart, and uh, so on. Uh, down here were the strong back, weak mind people, and then the, uh, the grades in between. And uh, his genetics was stupid. Uh, uh, he thought this could be done by selective mating. And he proposed that there be a big lottery in which people would choose their mates and would think it was the luck of the draw, when actually it was rigged by the folks on top who'd uh, get the, uh, the, the, the groups you, you uh, wanted. Now, uh, Plato, you know, uh, one of the great uh, minds of uh, Western philosophy, uh, uh, it's nonsense. Now, the difference between Plato, Diderot, and uh, our present situation is that uh, some of the things that they suggested that are futile, they couldn't bring them off, maybe could be done now. We don't know just how much. Maybe they could. And so they're much more dangerous. Well, one book uh, I know has a subtitle, uh, The Clash Between Genetics and Human Values. Uh, I don't like that subtitle. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a clash. Uh, genetics may serve human values, but it's, it's a risky business. One question, <clears throat> going one step back from mankind, we're not fully aware yet of the impact on the food supply that these uh, antibiotics have, uh, growth hormones, chlorine in our water. There are many things that we just really don't fully understand yet. What, what do you see being the dangers in the genetic engineering of our food supply? I mean, we already have the growth hormone in the milk production, and they're gen genetic, I'm sorry, genetically altering the genes of tomatoes, corn, and these yeah. other things. How, has this really been thought out? Is it really not dangerous? Well, uh, I think I'll duck that one because I I'm going to come pretty directly to it next time. It's a very important question. I'm glad you raised it now, but I'll, I'll say more about it next time. Uh, Phil, you call us at the uh, time when it's closed. Uh, you mentioned that sometime in the pudding that you with uh, Dr. Crick, you uh, to prove that evolution essentially worked and, and used it to prove his own atheism. Yet, I think some attempts have been made to kind of see if, if all of this was the result of cell division and the occasional mutation and then natural selection, that there'd still be an extremely low probability of coming out with a human being. And have you seen anything that's credible, I guess, no. thorough in that line? There are a lot of extravagant predictions of what might be done. Now, the reason I don't immediately dismiss them as impossible, even though uh, many of them, the best geneticists will say, are impossible, is that so many things I once thought impossible have happened. So I, uh, I, I'm uh, reluctant to say it. But uh, maybe I can show you next time uh, a, a recent article in uh, Newsweek uh, which kind of summarizes the number of announcements of new discoveries that after a year or so have been qualified. And uh, they, they didn't discover nearly as much as they claimed. 
And you see, the, the only way to keep up with this is read the press and uh, say a journal like Science Magazine, and uh, this is pretty good. The press tends to exaggerate. Uh, two reasons. The scientist who does something wants to think it's important and often uh, exaggerates the importance of what he or she's doing. Uh, just as I exaggerate the importance of most things I do and uh, so uh, announces it in uh, the most dramatic terms. And then the press wants a good story. And uh, if you uh, say, uh, let's see if I can give you a, an instant uh, example uh, here uh, of uh, the, the headlines are always uh, more uh, dramatic than the uh, content of the uh, story. All right, I don't uh, find it instantly. Uh, uh, I'll give you some examples next time. But uh, you know, the first announcement, and then, uh, or the headline, and then down to the last paragraph. Uh, no. I think. Uh, Take one more. One more. Yes. Question here is: Was this development or evolution did that happen by design? Mm -hmm. If so, then it had to be by somebody whose exi existence predated the entire system and somebody who is outside the system or not. Um, I don't expect yeah. to answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, everybody hold that question uh, for two weeks from today. <laughs> uh, uh, just for the moment, I'll say this. Uh, uh, Pascal, in the 17th century, incidentally, Pascal is, I think, the one person in human history who belongs on the short list of great scientists and the short list of great theologians. Uh, there, there are others. Uh, uh, Newton thought he was a theologian, but uh, it was hogwash. Uh, you know, uh, Pascal was uh, really a, a major character in both. Pascal looked at this world and said, uh, there is so much intricate uh, coordination, uh, it's impossible not to believe in a design. And they looked again and he said that there is so much goes wrong in it, it's hard to believe in design. And uh, he left it in the area of faith. Uh, not a faith that doesn't pay attention to all the evidences. You see, this is so wonderful. You say, how could it happen? And then you could say, why are there so many mistakes in it? See, an awfully vulnerable uh, system. Why are there these uh, genetically transmitted diseases? But uh, more about that, uh, I, I won't uh, give you the final answer, uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll look at it again. I think that one of the characteristic of a good power is one that stimulates the questions that really will be dealt with in the succeeding hours. <laughs> With that judgment, we've had a very good morning and evening. We do look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,